Hello everyone, I'm Jacob Kauf and I'm the Nerd in the Street, and today we're talking about fixing broken MP4 files. Alright everyone, so here's what's going on. A couple weeks ago, I was recording a Let's Play in a video game called Ruby Grim Eclipse. And it's a video game that Rooster Teeth makes, the first video game they've made. And I was recording a Let's Play of it because A, I wanted to play the game and it was pretty fun. And B, I've, you know, we've got the Nerd on the Street gaming channel that there's no content on right now. So I thought I'd kill two birds with one stone, record a Ruby Grim Eclipse Let's Play. You can hear all about the adventures of getting Grim Eclipse to work under Linux in that video. In fact, I might I might make a tech video about getting Gurm Eclipse to work in Linux because it has to do with virtual machines and emulators and whatnot. Um, or I might just include that at the beginning of that gaming video. But long story short, I ended up playing it in a virtual machine. Now, I was recording this under Ubuntu with a virtual machine with Windows 8 in it. I was recording my, my audio as I do with Audacity. You can see I've got Audacity running here to, to record my audio now from this Blue Yeti. And then the video was recording with a program called Simple Screen Recorder. And that is a Linux program. It's what we use to record. It's what I always use to record my screen. It works great for game capture um, when you're using Linux native games. And that's what we use for Displaced over on the Entertainment Channel. It also works great for just regular old screen capturing, which is what I was using for the Grim Eclipse video. Now, here's the deal. I recorded about an hour of gameplay, and then I went upstairs, got a drink of water, came back down, recorded another 30 minutes, and when I went upstairs, I stopped both the recordings, and I saved both the recordings. That's important to note in my story here. And I came back down, I played 30 more minutes, I started up the recording software again, played 30 more minutes, and then I made the mistake of trying to exit the virtual machine while still recording. Now that in itself is not a mistake, but in case none of you are aware, if you have VMware Workstation Player running under Ubuntu 16.04 and you try and exit any virtual machine in any way, it will freeze your entire computer. I'm not talking freeze like sometimes KDE Plasma goes a little wacky and I have to control Alt F2 into a virtual console and kill a couple of processes. I'm talking freeze like the mouse wasn't even moving anymore. And normally when I crash my computer under Linux, I can at least move the mouse still. Uh, it happens quite, uh, you know, more often than I'd, I'd care to admit, where my computer freezes and I can't do anything, but there's still hard drive activity and I can still move my mouse. No, no, this was completely different. There was no hard drive activity. I could not hear the, the hard drives working and I can hear them when they're working because I've got WD Blacks in here and those things are extremely loud. There was no activity on the hard drive activity lights and like I said, the mouse just plain wasn't moving, which very rarely happens. So this was like a very hard crash. So. Uh, even though I knew I was recording, I knew that the recording had stopped because there was no hard drive activity. So I was forced to hold down the power button on my computer until it turned off and then I turned it back on. Audacity actually saved my audio recording of my voice. So that was a great job, Audacity. Um, I've complained a lot about how unstable Audacity is, but I was very surprised when I opened up Audacity and it had auto saved my entire file. That was amazing. Simple screen recorder though, it doesn't have that kind of mechanism built in because it works a little bit differently. So I was recording to an mp4 file because a long time ago in a galaxy far far away I used Windows and I used Fraps under Windows to record things and if you've ever used Fraps you probably know about 10 minutes of Minecraft footage equals 4.3 gigabytes um, or, or, or around there. That's about you know, about the efficiency of what you get with Fraps. That's because Fraps saves AVI files, and those take up a lot of space. Now, when I moved over to Linux and I started using Simple Screen Recorder, there were a couple of other programs before Simple Screen Recorder was even around that I, I used in between, but, you know, when I moved over to Linux and started using these other desktop recording programs, uh, GTK Record My Desktop, uh, Kazam or something, and this other software, I found out that I can record to MP4 files, and in an MP4 file, I can record for like an hour and a half, and it'll only take up a gigabyte of space, because MP4 files are heavily compressed, but, you know, the compression isn't that lossy, you know, you don't, I, I don't know about the, the technical term of lossy, but you don't lose a lot of quality from what I can see when you use MP4 files. And that's why everything that I do, I do in an MP4 file. Even though, you know, I'm a supporter of, of uh, free Libre software, some people would make the argument that MP4 files are actually not Libre, so I should be using MKV files. But I don't. I just, I, 
have always used mp4 files because they just work. So that's why I was using an mp4 file. I was recording to mp4 for 30 minutes and then, like I said, computer froze, had to restart, and what I was left with was an mp4 file that was truncated. Now that's a technical term, that's like an actual, that's not me using a figure of speech when I say it was truncated, that's the term people use for this sort of thing. This can also happen if your camera is recording to an mp4 file and your camera runs out of battery, that mp4 file might become truncated, which means how an mp4 file works, loosely. You know, if you know more about this stuff than I do, feel free to start up a conversation about it down in the comments or at our forums over at anotherstreet.com. But how an MP4 file works is it records frames and it compresses them and MP4 is a an inter-frame codec which means that each frame is built off of all of the frames before it so each frame only contains the data about what changed between the frame before it and in that frame. And then at the end of the MP4 file, um, you know, the, the compression adjusts itself based on what's going on on screen. So the compression's not always, you know, compressing at the same rate. If, you're, if your screen has a lot going on and there's a lot of stuff moving around, then it's not going to be compressed as much, whereas if you're having something like this scene right now, most of this frame is not actually moving every frame. Most of, most of what's in the shot of the camera right now is staying the same every frame. So what you might see if you compress this footage is that the camera's not storing the data of these pixels that are making this cabinet right here. Those pixels are just being repeated over and over again because the camera knows there's no movement happening up there. Or, you know, the MP4 file format knows there's no movement happening up there, so it doesn't need to store data for that, that cabinet for every frame. Whereas um, if you're playing a video game and you move your character's head and the entire frame, you know, the entire frame moves at once, it's like if I walk up to the camera, you know, now the entire frame is moving at once. So that particular section of the video right there that I just showed you, that is going to take up more space because it can't be compressed as heavily and now my camera's off center. So every MP4 file, even if it's the same resolution and you tell it to record in the same quality, it's going to be compressed differently based on what's in the file. And then when you click stop recording, be it in your screen recording software or on your camera, when you click stop recording, then your camera or your software is going to save a bunch of data about the methods it used to compress that file. And this is where this starts getting a little bit above my head and what I know at this point. And I am learning more about this stuff every day, you know, in the, just in the general process of video editing. Just a couple weeks ago, I didn't know the difference between interframe and interframe codecs. I know that now. I'm always learning stuff. I learned a lot when I was trying to fix my problem here. So, at the end of the mp4 file is where the compression data is saved. So when you go to play back a file, let's say I open up VLC and I tell it to play an mp4 file, what VLC is going to do is it's going to read the ending of the file, and the ending of the file is going to tell it how to decompress the video to play it, and then it goes back to the beginning and starts playing the video. So when you have a truncated mp4 file, and this can be, once again, your computer crashes while you're screen recording, your camera runs out of battery so it can't properly close the file, or if you're downloading an mp4 file and the download gets interrupted halfway through, if anything happens to the mp4 file where you don't have that compression data at the end, the mp4 file can no longer be played. And I'll actually, I'll tell you what error you get, uh, well I'll demonstrate the error and everything when I'm on the screen, because I'm going to cut to the screen here in a minute and I'm going to show you how to fix this. So it took me a long, long while to figure out how to fix this, and one of my issues was I found a great program for Linux called Untrunk, and it is made to restore damaged truncated MP4, M4V, MOV, or 3GP video, provided you have a similar but not broken video. So for this to work, you need to have a video that was recorded on the same camera as the video that you're trying to recover. In my case, I needed a video that was um, recorded using the same program, the same screen recording program. It's also worth noting, by the way, that it can't just be the same program or camera recording the footage. I actually, from experience, I can tell you it needs to be similar footage. So, like I said, my 30 minute broken file was gameplay footage. When I tried to use a 10 second file recorded with the same software of just a static desktop, it didn't work. It only worked, it only recovered the file when I used my hour long working gameplay footage of the same game. Uh, because that's very similar footage, it's got very similar compression data. So that was, that was what worked to recover the broken 
video. So you're going to need your broken video and try and get a video that it's on recorded using the same equipment as what the broken video was recorded with, but also recorded with similar things happening on screen. That's important too. So what this program does is it copies the compression data from the end of a working file and it pastes that compression data into a broken file. And you can actually, if you know about the actual file format of MP4 and you actually know about like the file format of like the H.264 encoding specification, you can actually open up a hexadecimal editor. You can open up the files basically in a text editor and you can copy that compression data yourself uh, from one file to another. What this program does is I opened up a couple of files in a hexadecimal editor and I looked up online how to how to copy them myself, but hexadecimal editors are, I mean, like when you open up one of these files in a hexadecimal editor, it's literally just random letters and numbers. And there is a method to the madness, but I don't know that method. And it would have taken me probably a couple weeks to learn that method. But what this program does is it's got programmed in the MP4 file format, the M4V, MOV, and 3GP file formats. It's got those four file formats programmed in. And basically what it does is it, it, it's a script. It's a C++ script that goes through and just automatically finds, here's where the compression data starts in the working file, here's where the compression data ends, copy all of that to the broken file. It automates the process for you. If you want to hear a much longer version of this story, um, I, I told a longer version of this story in the Nerd on the Street podcast last week. So go and subscribe to the podcast and maybe I'll link the episode down below once it eventually gets published. But yeah, this is the short version of the story that I'm telling. So um, the reason this is important to note, if you go and download Unshrunk, it's hosted on GitHub. If you go and download it from GitHub, it only works with files up to two gigabytes. And that's not gonna work because my reference file, the, the, the working file that I had was 3.5 gigabytes and I believe that the broken file is also over two gigabytes. But by default, um, Untrunk cannot handle either file, the reference file or the broken file being over two gigabytes. I think it was written for 32-bit in particular. I spent hours and hours and hours and hours running this program with, with my files and seeing the error messages that came out of it, searching through the GitHub repo and the issues that have been posted there and searching the web for C++ things that I didn't know because I'm not a programmer. Some changes that I made were things like converting from 32-bit to 64-bit variable types um, and switching to variable types that were more accurate. Other things that I did involved just removing an error message. And there was like a part in the program that said, if this, then throw an error message and exit. And I just took that little if statement right out. And you can call me stupid. You can call me a bad programmer. Um, and I admit I'm not a programmer. I am an IT guy. And as an IT guy, my job is to fix problems. Uh, I'm a problem solver and I solved the problem and I got my video working by making these changes to this, this program. Another thing that I had to do was I had to compile. Um, this didn't work under Ubuntu. Uh, I first did was trying it under Ubuntu. This worked eventually when I compiled it under Arch and I compiled it with its own contained version of uh, libav codec, I believe was what it was called. Yep, libav. Um, it needed its own version of that that I compiled on this computer and then I compiled Unshrunk with that self-compiled version of libav and that created a binary. So what I'm going to do is people have posted a lot of issues in the past on the GitHub page of this, um, this project talking about how this program doesn't work with files over, over two gigabytes. And I'm, I don't remember how many changes I made. It's probably between two and 10. Um, I didn't make any less than, uh, probably between three and 10. I did not make any less than three changes to the code. I did not make any more than 10 changes to the code. But when you consider the fact that I don't really know C++ a whole lot. 10 changes was a lot for me to make. And I went through and there were, you know, three or four different issues that were not linked together, um, that I, I made changes based on several completely disconnected issues on the GitHub page to get this working with files over two gigabytes. So my point is that it was difficult to do. 
And so to prevent somebody else from having to do that again, now if I was a, a developer, what I would do if I was a, you know, a proper good developer is I would submit these changes back into the GitHub repository. Problems with that, I don't know Git, and I didn't track the changes that I made because I'm kind of, I was a little short-sighted, but I didn't know if this was going to work, so I was just kind of hacking away at it. And um, yeah, not a developer, just trying to trying to get my files working uh, when I was doing this. So I wasn't keeping track of the changes that I made. Now, yeah, um, you can run diff commands to figure out the changes between my version of the file and the version from GitHub. If you're a developer and you want to take the time to do that and resubmit these changes to the GitHub page, I highly encourage you to do that. That would be, I'm sure that the creator of this program would be very grateful if somebody out there did that but what I am going to do this is the you know the best that I can do right now uh, with the knowledge and resources and time that I have in a minute I'm gonna show you how to use this tool and I'm going to put my version of the tool my modified version in a tarball I'm going to I will check to make sure that the license allows me to do this but I'm pretty sure this thing is GPL um, if we look at the ah, uh, here we go it's GPL software you can freely distribute redistribute modify and use under the terms of the GNU general public license so that right there tells me that you know as long as I publish from my limited understanding of the GPL as long as I publish my version under the GPL then it's okay for me to do this I'll go and make sure uh, you know, obviously, while I'm in the production process of this video, I'll go and make sure that's correct. But the plan right now is I'm going to throw my version, including the source code, so you you can see the changes that I made. And somebody out there, if you want to send this back to that Git page and try and get those changes implemented in the program itself, you can do that. I'll also include my binary because I know how annoying it is when you can only download a software and its source code and compiling doesn't work on your machine for one one thing or another. I don't know if anything that, you know, that I have on my computer would affect the usage of this program if this will or won't work for you if you just use the pre-compiled binary that I'll include. But yeah, I'll include both the binary that I made and the source code in a tarball. You can get that in the description of this video. I'll host it on my own web server and feel free to take that source code and figure out what I did to make this work. Because like I said, I, I, I removed error messages that I wasn't quite sure what they did, but they were coming up in the terminal. So I just removed the condition, you know, the checks for those error messages. Um, I changed variable types and I, I think I updated some things that, that it was just outdated C++ code. But yeah, um, that's what I'm going to do. So if you're wanting to fix your video file, pretty sure this will only work under Linux. Uh, you can try it under Mac OS if you want. Definitely not going to work under Windows. Actually, I don't know about that. Only guaranteeing that it'll work under Linux or only recommending. I'm not guaranteeing anything. Try it under Linux if you got Linux. And uh, yeah, so if you have a truncated MP4 file and I'll show you what that looks like in just a minute here when we cut to the desktop, I'll tell you how you can know if you have a truncated MP4 file. Hopefully this is useful for you. And if your files are under two gigabytes, then you can probably just go and download the unmodified version from the github page i'll certainly link that and everything in the description too without further ado i probably how long have i been freaking talking i've been talking for 25 minutes wow that's an intro if i've ever heard one so if you've gotten through that you now get to see how to use this program to fix your truncated or broken mp4 files here we go. All right, so here we are on the desktop. Uh, first of all, I want to point out this is the website for the original version of Untrunk. And over here, we have the GitHub page. So once again, I will link both of these in the description if you want to go and take a look at this stuff and at the creator. But here is the practical application of this just as soon as these files get done copying. All righty, so we have here my two files. And I actually mistook the, uh, the sizes of them. They were a bit bigger than I thought. The the working file is 4.6 gigabytes and the unworking file was 3.3 gigabytes. So if we open both of these up, here's what we see. Um, file number one, which is working. All right, uh, so here's the video. Um, here, here's the video and you can see I've got the strip at the top here. I'm in, I'm in Windows 8 inside of VMware Workstation Player, whatever they call it, VMware Player. So we can skip forward a bit in the video here. And here's me seeing that this is working and adjusting some video settings within the virtual machine. I was astounded that it was working in the virtual machine. And um, yeah, we can go here. You can see me uh, playing. 
I'm gonna turn down my headphone volume here. So you will not be able to hear me talking in this video. Like I said, my voice was being recorded by Audacity, but the gameplay audio is in this video. So we can go through here and, you know, the entire way. So here's where we were right when I ended the video. And at this point, I decided after I killed this guy, oh, that's what happened. All right, so I was actually dealing with running out of space on the Ubuntu hard drive. I really need to get another archival hard drive because I'm running out of storage space on my, my desktop here. So VMware paused my virtual machine because I was running out of space. So when that came up, I decided to take the opportunity to pause the recordings, um, you know, save the files and go upstairs and get a drink of water. Because when I'm talking, uh, you know, how long was this file? This file was 54 minutes. So I had just been talking, narrating this video for 54 minutes. I, you know, was a little bit, a little bit dehydrated. So that is the explanation behind that box and the ending of this video. That's when I decided to take a break. And then here is the next file. So you can see this was um, 21, 49, 47. This was 22, 51, just over an hour later. So if we open this up, what happens? If we open it up, um, you know, I'm using MPV as my default media player here. It's launching. Oh, it just closed. Okay. So what happens if we open this up in VLC? Oh, oh, VLC just, you know, just doesn't, uh, doesn't play it. So what happens if we open up a terminal here and we go and we VLC screen 22 and we try and play this from the terminal. Oh, M O O V Adam not found. Hmm. That was the issue here. M O O V Adam not found. Now, if you see this, that means that you are missing the compression data at the end of your MP4 file. That is called the Adam or the M O O V Adam move Adam. The move Adam is, is the compression data, the data that the video player needs to decompress your video. So even though there is, and this is why I kept going and why I didn't give up, you know, after I made partial recoveries or after I, you know, after I spent a day and a half working on this, why I just kept on powering through until I fixed this files because there's 3.3 gigabytes of data here. And I knew that this was not 3.3 gigabytes of random data. This is 3.3 gigabytes of video. It just is missing that little tiny bit at the end called a move atom. So I don't know if I still have a hexadecimal editor um, installed. I don't think I have a hexadecimal editor installed still. If you have a hexadecimal editor, you can open these two files up and you can actually go to the ending of this file and see all of the data that's there. And you can open up this file and see all the data that's not there. It just ends with a bunch of zeros. All right, so this is the file we want to be able to play. Um, it's a 30 minute file, give or take. Like I said, this is the hour long file that works. So let's get to fixing this. So I'm going to include this entire folder in the tarball that I'm going to link in this video. Let's open this up in a new window. And here's what we have in here. We have the, the download from Untrunk on GitHub and then the libav download of the source code of that. And thanks, uh, will you freaking open up tarballs in arc instead of opening up tarballs in kwrite? That would be great. All right, do you remember that? There you go. All right. So if we go into the untrunk master folder here, this contains a libav folder. This is where I compiled libav on my computer. So we ended up with, you know, a binary of libav in here after I compiled it, I think. We've got an executable here, ffmpeg executable, and um, yeah, a couple other executables in here. So if we go back up to untrunk master, these .c++ files and these .h files were the files that I was looking around and making changes to when I was trying to get this working. And then untrunk, this right here is the executable file that was created when I compiled this on my system. So we are going to open up a terminal here and here's how you use untrunk. And um, we'll do dot slash untrunk help, uh, dash dash help. All right, so it tells you the usage right here untrunk, any options, the good file, and then the bad file. We don't need any options, I don't think. So we're just going to do dot slash untrunk. And the dot slash is because we're operating this terminal within this folder right here. So dot slash untrunk. Gonna drag in and paste the location of the good file. And then we'll drag in and we'll paste the location of the bad file. And we'll press enter and we'll see what it does. So it's reading the bad, the, the good file right now. It's reading the good file and it's going to 
pick out of that good file just the compression data out of the end of it. Um, so th I got an error message here uh, originally that there was some like overflow buffer whatever in the RAM because you know this video is clearly you know 4.6 gigabytes is more than two gigabytes which was the original limit for this program. I no longer get that error but if we open up a uh, system monitor here you can see that our RAM usage is up to 7.4 gigabytes which is kind of you know I know I'm running Firefox and everything but that's kinda high and then we can see um, it doing stuff we can see it doing stuff so now it is going through and processing uh, the bad file and if we if let's just stop this here and read this for a second oh no can you can you can you stop scrolling that's alright we can go back and read it once uh, once it's not rushing us to read it. Okay, and now it just fixed the file. It's already got the fixed file, and it is currently writing that fixed file to a you know a the hard drive. It's got the file, the entire file on the RAM. What it does is it fixes the file. But while it's fixing it, it, it stores the fixed file in the RAM. And by the way, this is a non-destructive tool. It is not going to modify your broken file. That was one thing I was concerned about. Yeah, there, at one point, one of the issues was that I was, I was getting to the point where it fixed the entire file and then it wasn't writing the fixed file to the hard drive. That was annoying. But yeah, when you get this... Um, when you get this error message, it's done. And we can go in here and let's try this. And it actually opens up. Look at that. And I, you know what, since this was a video and since I'm a video producer, I, I prepared myself ahead of time. I had everything in the right folders and I, you know, I spent the entire two days of my life doing nothing but pouring over this code and, and making it work. That looks super easy. It was actually way harder to do than, than what, what I just showed you. But I'm trying to make it this easy for you guys. That's literally all you have to do to fix your file. Is you you just I'm gonna pause this so I don't get hit by a copyright from Jeff Williams and Rooster Teeth. But that is all you have to do to fix your MP4 file. After you know before this you had to do a whole lot. Before I made this I upload. I'm just proud. I'm sorry. I'm I realized I didn't even write this program, guys. I didn't write this program, and I'm I'm not even a programmer. But I'm sorry if it sounds like I'm tooting my own horn. But I'm just so proud of myself for getting this working because the, there was a long period of time when it was looking like I was not going to get this working. So yeah, in the spirit of, of what we do here, hopefully uh, this will help you guys because like I said, that was the easiest freaking thing ever. So if you can see what it was doing, it was going through uh, and it was it, it was processing the, the broken file. Just ignore all of these, you know, success for no particular reason, failed for not particular reason. Um, just ignore all those errors because the, the freaking file works and we can you know jump through it we can read different parts of it um, freaking amazing and and then here you can see the point all right see the saving virtual machine state this is VMware about to screw me and then it screwed me and it crashed the computer um, so someone might want to tell VMware to get on that too so so that uh, VMware doesn't crash the computer anymore but yeah that's how you do it guys I'm just let's do that again because it, that I, it doesn't it doesn't do justice. That's it does not do justice to how difficult this is supposed to be. All right, we're gonna remove that. We're gonna run this one more time. All right, so once again, dot slash untrunk fixed file broken file enter. It reads the fixed file into the memory. It processes the broken file and saves the fixed file into the memory and then it writes the fixed file from the memory to your hard drive or SSD whichever you happen to have in your computer and then it throws an error message <clears throat> alright eventually it will exit okay so eventually it will exit It'll say aborted core dumped, and, and that popped up there because I tried playing this before. All right, so actually when that when this thing comes up that looks like an error message, don't uh, exit it like I did the first time. Just wait for it to quote unquote abort, and then you have your fixed file. And now you can make a let's play and not have to replay the game, although I might stop to replay the game because I'm not sure if I lost my, my progress yet, actually. 
but yeah, then you can go and, and you can you can make your Let's Play in peace because the gaming channel is supposed to be fun. It's like tech channels, a lot of work. Entertainment channels, super amount of work. Like gaming channels, supposed to be where we can unwind and you know just oh play a video game, Jacob. It'll be fun. Play video games. It, you know it'll be fun. It won't add to your stress at all. And then you're freaking you know your computer crashes and then you spend two days trying to get your footage recovered and it's the most stressful thing in the world. All right, I I just cannot get over. The fact that, like, I thought that, you know, normally my videos, it never goes this smooth. If you're a regular watcher and you're in the street, my videos never go this smooth. Uh, they, there's always, I always screw something up in the video and do something wrong. But no, we just had two demonstrations of this software just working because I did all the actual work beforehand. Once again, not to toot my own horn, but nobody else that I, I you know, I was, I was searching Google with so many different phrases. If someone else had done this before, I would have found it. So I took this program this guy wrote like years ago that was made for, for smaller files. I changed it a bunch and now it works with big files. Download it in the description below and that includes source code because I'm a, a, a believer in open source and even, you know, freedom respecting software since this is GPL software here. Hopefully this helps you guys as much as it helped me. And personally, I know that in the future I'm going to be uh, switching my screen recorder over to a non-compressed format or at least an interframe format. I'm going to basically do some research to make sure that if my screen recorder crashes in the future, I won't have to go through this again because it, like I said, most stressful thing ever when you're not sure if you lost data or not. But yeah, if you have any questions or, you know, if you're, it, honestly, if your file doesn't work with this, then I probably can't help you because it, it took everything that I had to get this to work for me. But if you have issues with this, I understand going on GitHub and talking to developers that actually know what they're doing can be a little scary. So if you're looking for something a little less intimidating, feel free to drop by our forums over at nerdinthestreet.com to talk about this. Uh, let me know if this helped you. Definitely, um, you know, check out the the author of this program in the description of this video because they deserve more credit than I do because they're the ones who wrote this thing in the first place um, and they're the ones who actually know how these codecs work on the hexadecimal level. So yeah, that is everything for for this video. That's 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 it. I wow, I just cannot believe that was that was all that it was. It's all it takes now. It took me so long to get that working, and and now it's working just fine. But this this video is way too long. That intro was way too long. So yeah, thank you guys for watching. See you next time. I'm Jacob Kaufman. I'm there on the street, and I'll see you guys later. Bye.